May I speak and may we all hear in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we've heard it's Passion Sunday. And passion does not mean suffering all the time, though it probably results in it. But what it does mean is that you accept what is coming to you, whatever it is. You're passive rather than active. So Jesus has spent his ministry so far in extreme activity. Uh, and when necessary, he has no doubt said, Father, save me from this hour when a mob was about to attack him. But from now on, he's no longer going to do that. He's going to take whatever is thrown at him. And he simply looks to God the Father to save him only where God allows that to happen. And otherwise, he hands himself over to whatever comes his way. And so, uh, whilst he's active with the disciples from now on in John's Gospel, from now on, whatever evil is thrown at him, he'll take it. Uh, and we had a reading from Jeremiah, who was introduced just before we started as being another miserable prophet. Uh, in fact, he's not that miserable in this moment, because he's actually predicting what, what Jesus is going to do for us. He's predicting what's called a new covenant, and it's probably easier to say uh, a new relationship, because uh, the covenant isn't entirely spelt out. Um, so it's referred to in the New Testament in Corinthians and Hebrews. And it's a new relationship which has got to occur if the disasters that have been occurring in Jeremiah's time are, are ever going to uh, be resolved. Because what they've done is they, they put a stop to God's plan of redemption. God's plan was to bring people back from the fall of in the Garden of Eden to bring them back to a state of total reconciliation with God, uh, godliness on their part, uh, a, a perfect uh, world, a perfect relationship. Uh, Jeremiah lived uh, from about 650 BC to 570, so he experienced the exile or so it happened, I spent a lot of time telling people why this exile had occurred, why Jerusalem had been effectively raised to the ground, including God's temple. And so uh, he, he gets a name for being a Jeremiah, a misery. But he also is saying, what, what's God going to do with this? How, how is he going to bring back this history of redemption that... Um, will bring us all back from the power of sin and evil which took over when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden and which had been getting worse and worse and worse uh, in history as God's chosen people who were meant to bring about this kept failing. Uh, the uh, charges that Jeremiah is told to bring against the God's people who were meant to be being a blessing to the whole world uh, was that they were uh, worshipping foul gods like Baal and Ashtoreth. They were worshipping money, power, sex. They were getting rich by oppressing the poor and anyone else that was weaker than them. They were unjust, violent, lying, Things couldn't have been worse. And then that ended in their complete defeat and uh, going into exile. They'd shown themselves incapable uh, of performing God's perfect plan for, for his people and God's perfect plan for the redemption of the whole world through his people. It was a disaster. They, were fail they failed so badly that God had to create a new relationship with his people. And a new covenant, it's often called. A, a new relationship uh, 
as we read in Jeremiah, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will make, I will make this covenant with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them so that they, they know his law, God's law. It's always up against them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall know me. That's important. From the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. From now on, it was God who was going to have to turn his people into ones who could readily be moved towards a full relationship with God and be used to help bring about God's plan of redemption throughout the whole world. And uh, it took almost 500 years for this covenant, this relationship to be built. And it was only built uh, through Jesus's life, death and resurrection. And all that Jeremiah predicted came about. First of all, God's people eventually receive God's Holy Spirit. They know him. They have the Holy Spirit in them to write God's law in their minds. They have a, a victory over the power, the grip of sin and death through Christ, freeing them. And they have Christ, who is God, in a knowable form. And not only that, Christ represents Israel, and he knows God. So all this is predicted by Jeremiah, and, and it is wonderful. No misery here. And so Christ becomes human according to God's plan. Take over from the whole people of Israel. The job that he had given to Israel and they had failed at. Uh, he is sinless and, of course, is immediately in conflict with those who live by sin. Uh, in our gospel reading with, with John, we, we, we arrive at a moment in Jesus's life where he realizes that his ministry on earth is, is coming to that moment planned by God for this major change in, in his people. Uh, he's proved to be a popular hero. Uh, we'll know about that on Palm Sunday. He's proved a hero from his miracles, raising Lazarus from the dead and others. And his obedience to God and his, his wonderful gentleness and love, as well as his enormous authority. And no doubt it would have been possible for him as son of God to get rid of all the opposition that he was receiving from the Jewish church and government establishment uh, to increase the numbers and power of all those people who thought he was wonderful. Uh, indeed, at the beginning of our lesson, we heard about these Greeks asking about Jesus. It looked as though his influence was going to spread uh, far beyond uh, Israel, far beyond Judah. But instead, he says, no, I've got to go down a different route, God's route. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And he goes on to say, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. 
And then there's marvelous words, which we'll come back to. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was dying. And he also goes on to justify this change by saying to the people who were following him, wishing to follow him, that they actually had to take part in this death themselves. They could only follow him by following him through his death on their behalf, not by following him through increasing his wonderful popular appeal, increasing his power to get rid of the Romans or get rid of the unpleasant aspects of the Jewish establishment. He's saying, no, you've got to come with me down this path, the path of the cross. We can't just increase our uh, charismatic appeal, our power to bump off those who are against us. We've, we've got to go down the path of death. And so he does say, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. It's going to be radical what Jesus will achieve through the cross, not just more popularity. And so we, we come to this moment of the beginning of the passion. But the story of redemption doesn't, of course, stop there. To put this, these passages in the full context, we have to remember, yes, there's then the resurrection on Easter Day, Christ's ascension to the right hand of God, where he has all power and authority. All rulers are beneath him. And then there's the continuing part, uh, the continuing task of the church of the church that he has created for himself so that his work carries on. He as the head of the church and we now as the members of the church, all members together in bringing about a situation whereby God's uh, drawing of people to himself can be seen throughout all the world. And that again involves to some extent our dying, our dying to sin, perhaps a large extent, our dying to sin, and then our rising in the life of Jesus. Of course, that then ultimately leads on uh, as we read in, in the letter to the Ephesians. All things in heaven and on earth will be brought together under the rule of Christ. And in Revelation, that there will be a final wiping out of all evil. And there will be a new creation. Christ will still be carrying the wounds of the glory. So what is our role here? Um, we've only got a certain amount of time left in... in um, Lent, and uh, we may be extremely busy trying to keep all our uh, Lenten resolutions, but uh, th there might be something growing out of this that could could be inspiring. Uh, and this is Christ's prediction: I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to me. And that, that is something where we may have one or two roles. One as, as part of the church, we are there to be continuing that drawing of people to Christ through bringing their awareness to Christ crucified for them. And to some extent, we then have to show ourselves to be ready to suffer for him, ready to suffer for the redemption of the world. 
and there's another way it comes alive and for us and, and that is that uh, we need to be drawn to Christ further By the grace of God, we have been drawn to some extent. But we still need that more. And that means that we need to be turning our attention to Christ lifted up from the earth. Christ on the cross. And to be longing to be drawn closer to him. And uh, uh, maybe many ways of, of doing that but 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 one way is to meditate the cross it is to put yourself in a position where you can you can really envision jesus on the cross drawing people to him and that pondering can best be done by reading rather once or twice the one account of the crucifixion from one of the gospels and again the best way for getting that into your mindset is to read it in the evening one day and read it again the next morning and then settle down and to cast your mind towards christ on the cross and then actually speak to jesus And two questions that you can ask of him on the cross is, the first one is, Jesus, who am I to you? And you'll love the answer. And if not, you'll be able to ask the, game, ask the next day. And the other question is, who are you to me? Uh, we thought we might be answering that question ourselves, perhaps, but in fact, uh, Jesus will give you a much better answer. And we then have to think, am I being drawn to Jesus? If so, thank you, Lord. Or What's getting in the way? Why am I not being drawn to Jesus? Show me, Lord. Please. It, it, it's a wonderful moment because it's such a graphic situation that you, you won't sleep through this kind of meditation. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, and it may be life-changing. And, and that said, uh, I pray that our time between now and Good Friday is, is well spent pondering Jesus on the cross for our salvation and the salvation of the whole world. Amen.